I'm a woodworker, but I'm also a self-taught guitar player, and I taught myself mainly by trying to emulate this guy, James Hetfield, the lead singer of Metallica. Now, I have always adored his signature Explorer, and I have no idea how to build a guitar. I just have a shop full of woodworking tools and woodworking experience. So, of course, I decided, let's go ahead and try to build a James Hetfield Tribute Explorer guitar all out of my garage. Now, one thing that woodworkers and guitar players have in common is I think most of them have thought about how cool it would be to build their own guitar. And most people, when they go to build their first guitar, usually do a kit or something like that, something a little simpler, maybe a Stratocaster or a Telecaster style guitar. And I chose to go the complete opposite way. Now, as I mentioned, I wanted to build a Gibson style explorer, just like James Hetfield. And one of the things that Gibsons are known for is that the headstock or where you would see the tuning machines at the top of the guitar are angled. And so to do that and to create that effect, I'm making a scarf joint here. Now, this is definitely not going to be a how to build a guitar because this is my first one and I learned a ton along the way. Now, to make this scarf joint and to glue it up, what I decided to do here was to go ahead and drill on the outsides of where I'm going to glue the joint up here. And what I did was I made sure to trace the actual neck and headstock of the guitar on there so that these screw holes that I'm using to hold this in place while the glue dries would be able to be cut out later. And one thing that I think I noticed in all of the guitar build videos that I watched and something that I certainly found is... There is a lot of clamping in building a guitar. There's a lot of odd angles for clamping. So you are going to see a ton of clamps in this video. And if you decide to build your own guitar, you will definitely need a ton of different clamps. Now, a lot of guitar building winds up actually being a lot of basic woodworking techniques. And here what I'm doing is making sure that I have a nice flat surface because as you can see, I'm going to start doing things like routing out a channel for the truss rod, working on the fretboard. And for that, I need a completely flat surface. Now, you'll see these templates that I'm using. I downloaded a file, uh, went and purchased one online, and then went to Staples and had them print these out on architect size paper and wound up cutting them out and making the templates myself. And I have to say, new guitar building tip, I would definitely buy templates if you were able to. So here I'm working on the truss rod and the truss rod is something that I think people that don't play guitar and even a lot of people who do play guitar don't really even know exists. So it is a rod that is in the middle of the neck and your neck is going to bow and change over time, especially with temperature and humidity changes as the seasons change. And so this truss rod sits here under the fretboard and you can make it curve one way or the other to either straighten or curve the fretboard a little bit. You need a little bit of curve or relief in the fretboard for everything to sound good. And so you need to have this truss rod in there. So I'm setting up a routing jig here with my router. And whenever I am routing for a particular piece like this, I use the piece itself, as you saw me there with the truss rod, to set the depth gauge for the router. And this is one of those processes that there's a lot of different ways to do this. If you have a nice square neck blank, you can use an edge guide and just draw a center line. In this case, making the scarf joint, it was a lot easier to just use this template. And this was the first of many specialty tools that I wound up kind of needing uh, to build this guitar from scratch. There is a lot that goes into building this that I did not realize at the start. So when you look at the truss rod itself, it is a pretty uniform thickness and depth until you get right up to the head there. And so after I routed out the channel, I'm marking out how wide the head is. And so I'm going to need to use chisels and a couple other hand tools to make that section a little bit wider to accept the truss rod. Now, one thing that I was kind of interested to find is that this is really one of those things that you can do with very simple tools. You can do it with hand tools. You can do it with power tools. There's all sorts of great resources out there. If you look online or look on YouTube of people who build amazing guitars with nothing but hand tools. And this was a portion of the build that I really felt hand tools were really the best for the job. I could have gone back in there and set the router back up and tried to route out a little deeper, route out a little wider. But using the chisels, the router plane was just a lot easier. 
So this is how we're going to eventually access the truss rod is through the headstock. You drill a hole that connects from the headstock to the truss rod, and that way you'll be able to fix your neck over time if you get bowing. Now, before I went over to the bandsaw and started cutting everything out, I went ahead and put my template on and drilled out the pilot holes where the tuning machines will eventually go here. And there's a couple different tools that wound up being kind of the heroes of this build. And the bandsaw was definitely the first one. If you're going to be building a guitar, a bandsaw is a fantastic thing to have. As you can see here, I'm using it to cut out the body. You're going to see me here in a minute using it to cut out the neck. And it really was an invaluable tool to have. Now, again, you could do this all with hand tools, but this just made it so much, so much easier. Now, if you're just starting out in woodworking, the bandsaw is a great skill to learn. And here you can see how I'm approaching cutting around this corner. The blade that I have in there is a little bit too wide, but I just make a bunch of relief cuts and then slowly go back in. And whenever you're using the bandsaw, one of the things that you want to make sure that you do, and in this case, I'm using the bandsaw as a precursor to a lot of template routing, is you want to cut as close to the line as you possibly can from your template without actually going into that line. So I'm moving fast here in the video, but this is not actual speed. I have this sped up probably five or six times the actual speed that I was going. And that's just for the pace of the video and so that you guys can keep the video moving here. But in real life with your bandsaw, you don't want to move super fast. Now, I want to talk about template routing because this is something that we see on social media a lot, and there is a ton of this in guitar building as well, and I have this sped up 150 times. It is 1,500% of its normal speed. I see far too many people on social media with far too much material left over moving far too quickly, especially when they get to end grain, making things like charcuterie boards and all that sort of stuff. You see a lot of that kind of template routing out there. And the router table and routers in general are a tool that you really, really need to make sure that you respect and take your time with. So this is real speed here coming around the corner with minimal material on end grain. So you can see how slow I'm actually moving. This particular clip is not sped up. The rest of these are definitely sped up again, the same deal as the bandsaw, just to kind of keep pace and everything. Now, what I'm doing here first is I don't have a template bit that is quite tall enough, so I'm starting with a shorter bit, cutting most of the material flush with the template, and then I'm just gonna raise the bit here and again, go back through and make passes. And it's interesting, a lot of people that I talk to are pretty scared of the router table, and yet there's this dichotomy where we see a lot of crazy router table use on the internet, but then I think it causes a lot of fear with people too. So learn how to use your tools safely. So once again, back to the bandsaw here, and it's time to keep working on this neck. So I'm cutting away most of the material for the thickness of the neck. And if there was another tool hero for this build for me, it was that oscillating spindle sander. You're gonna see that quite a bit in this build. So once I got the neck shaped mostly how I wanted it, it was time to start working on the fretboard. And this is what happens when you don't turn your dust collection on at the bandsaw. Not a good thing to do. I'm using rosewood here for the fretboard. So I cut it closely to thickness and then use the drum sander to sneak up. Now the thickness ultimately is going to be a quarter of an inch. I went ahead and cut it to five sixteenths so that I would have some room for sanding. Now, of all of the handy tools that you can get to build guitars, I thought this one was probably the most useful. It is a fret slotting miter box, and it helps you set the depth for each fret, and along with a little jig, helps you cut each fret precisely. And this was my first time doing this. I didn't want to try doing it by hand. I'd love to try that down the road. Now, once you've made your fretboard, you want to make sure that you get it in perfect. You don't want it sliding around with all this glue. And yes, that is a toothpick. One of the tricks is that you drill some small holes through a fret slot near the bottom of the fretboard and near the top or near the higher frets and the lower frets. And you use those as registration points so that when you glue this up, it glues in nice and straight. You'll notice there's a white center line on the fretboard that matches with the center line there, kind of down at the butt of the neck. 
And the center line in guitar building I found is incredibly important. You don't want your fretboard going off kilter. And what did I tell you about clamps? There's tons of them. So now it's time to start shaping the neck a little bit more. And one of the things that you notice is I'm doing a ton of work on the neck first. I've seen people build these guitars in different ways. Some people start more on the body. Most people I know of start mostly on the neck in doing my research. And so that's where I'm doing most of my work. Now here again, you can see this oscillating drum sander is a super useful tool to have if you are into building guitars. It just made so much of the shaping a lot easier. And again, what I'm trying to do is get really close to the final thickness of the neck before I go into all of the hand shaping and remove as much material as possible with power tools before I have to go in and start using a rasp. Now what I've done here is marked on the sides where I know how thick I want those sides to be. And I'm just gonna use this rasp to go ahead and work my way up. Now you can see my super nice, super expensive cut up box that is giving me my neck profile. And what I'm doing is going to the first fret, the sixth fret and the 12th fret. And I'm using a rasp starting with a more gritty rasp and moving up to a more fine rasp and cutting out the neck profile in those three sections. And a lot of this is feel. You'll see me frequently throughout the neck shaping, reaching my hand in and touching it. So much of guitar playing is feel. And so a lot of times I'm feeling, do I have bumps and everything? And just looking for that feel of the neck. Now, once you've carved the correct profile at those three different spots, now all I have to do is connect the dots. So again, I'm gonna use a variety of hand tools here to go ahead and move the bulk of this material. Again, starting with rougher tools and moving into finer things. And here, I'm doing a little bit of work carving the volute. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm pretty sure it's volute. But making that scarf joint, that scarf joint could in theory be a bit of a weak point there in the neck. And so the volute adds a little bit of thickness there right at the scarf joint. I also find it's a nice place just to kind of register your hand. And so you know as you're moving up towards that first fret, uh, it's a nice spot just for playing. So once I got everything roughly shaped with rasps, then it was time to start a lot of hand sanding. And again, if you're not into sanding, then guitar building is definitely not for you. This is a really good trick that I picked up, not from guitar building, but just from general woodworking. If you have one of those oscillating drum sanders or any sort of cylindrical object, you can wrap your sandpaper around that to give you something to work around curves makes it a little bit easier for hand sanding. It's a trick that I like to use a lot for furniture making as well. Came in super handy here for guitar building. Now I elected to go with side dots only. Uh, I decided not to go with dots on the fretboard. And one of the things that was interesting about this is these are super tiny. This is a two millimeter drill bit and I'm drilling down. You can see just barely down in there, getting a little dab of CA glue in. And then I had to get some tweezers to use these tiny things. Now, they sell bigger material for this. These I just purchased, I think from Stumac. Um, but I'm CA gluing these in, using the tweezers to get them there, and then spraying a little bit of activator here to go ahead and light that up and get that to dry quickly. You may notice at the 12th fret, I had a little bit of an indiscretion. One of them came out a little bit out of alignment, but this is just for me, that's okay. We won't, we won't tell anybody about that. So back to hand tools here, using the chisel just to clean this up and then coming back with a pass with my sander just to make sure everything is nice and flush. Now, this was a decision that I actually posted on my Instagram as to whether or not I should put some of these reflective fret marker dots on the actual face of the fretboard there. And the Instagram people voted and they requested no inlay dots. So now I'm actually shaping the fretboard. And if you don't play guitar, all guitar fretboards have what's called a radius, and it basically is just a curvature to it. They go all the way from being very curved to almost completely flat, but you can see using this radiusing block that I'm sanding off the sides first. And this was a long, long process, but very worth it. You sand it and you go higher and higher up in grits. Uh, I think the grits got up into the thousands, and you can see here, definitely well worth it. Got a nice radius on there. Uh, and this is Honduran rosewood, and I just love the look and feel of a rosewood fretboard, and this is just really, really pretty material. 
So now the neck is mostly shaped and it was time to start going into some of the other neck details before glue up. I went ahead and drilled all the holes for the tuning machines here in the headstock. And now it's time to actually put the frets themselves in. You can see I'm using some very specialty tools here. There's a fret depth gauge. With that sanding, I just had to go back and make sure that I didn't have any high or low spots. Uh, and I certainly did have a few, so I had to go back in and just kind of hand clean these out. Now, the way that you go about this is, as you can see, I go to each fret and I cut it a little bit oversized. So I'm cutting that thing oversized, and then this is a fret bending tool. Uh, there's going to be, I'm sure, some luthiers that watch this that I just hope you guys recognize that this is not what I do normally. So I'm probably butchering names of tools and all sorts of stuff. Bear with me and... Give me some tips. If you think that I could do something better, you see that I did something completely wrong. I love doing this and I plan on building more guitars. So please feel free to leave tips for me. So you bend them to close to the radius, you hammer them in, and then you go ahead and clip off the excess. And then I'm using this sanding block just to get any sort of material that may be hanging proud over the edge of the fretboard off. And then what I'm doing is approaching the end of the frets at about a 45 degree angle. So it creates a nice kind of beveled angle there that'll feel really nice when you're playing. Uh, you don't want these frets to be completely straight there at the end. You want them to have that nice angle in towards the middle. Now I've mentioned that there were a couple tool heroes of guitar building. The first one was the bandsaw. The second one was the oscillating drum sander, oscillating spindle sander sort of deal. And the drill press is definitely the third. And this was the project that actually really inspired me to go out and get a new drill press here recently, which is gonna be coming up in a future video. So the body of the guitar has cavities for the pickups, it has cavities for the electronics, and then a pocket that the neck is going to go into. And you don't wanna just start off with the router. You could see I'm moving a decent amount of material out of here. And so you start off at the drill press. You could also do this with chisels. You could do this with a handheld drill. Those would be miserable processes to me, but to each their own. So you start off at the drill press and then I made a little template guide here and I'm using a template bit here on the router to go ahead and route out the neck pocket. Now I've seen people who have also made their own templates for the pickups. Uh, there's a guitar building company that I used quite a bit called Stuart McDonald. I don't have any affiliation with them, but they also sold this nice acrylic uh, template for routing out the pickup pockets here. So you can see that's what I am doing there. So pretty standard process for guitar building. It's another basic woodworking skill. And now that I've got the neck pocket cut out and now that I've got the pickup pockets routed out, I'm drilling a hole to connect the two pickup sections together. And the reason for that is I need the wire from that neck pickup to run all the way down through, as you can see demonstrated here. Eventually that electronics will have to go into the actual electronic cavity itself. So what you see me doing here is cutting out a little bit of bulk material that is going to get in the way of that neck pickup. If I don't cut it out now, I'm doing that before I glue it up. And this is quite honestly, the most stressful glue up of my life. I had been working on this thing at this point, probably for a couple months. And you can see I did a nice dry fit. Initially, I thought things were gonna go great. I didn't think about the fact that most of the times when you put glue in, things get a little swollen. And you can see I'm starting to panic here. I'm realizing that I can't just get this thing in with hand pressure. This is going to be a pain. I also need to make sure it's in as far as it can be. You can see that there's a little bit of a gap developing there. One of the tricky things is this style of guitar has what's called a break angle on it. So the neck is actually angled down two degrees from the top of the body. And so that made some of the trimming that I had to do ahead of time really tricky because, again, I had to factor in the break angle to trimming out the portion of the neck that's going into the neck pocket there. And you can see as much as I tried and as hard as I worked, there was still a little bit of a gap there. Now, again, this is my first guitar. I'm learning this all on the fly. And so definitely some good lessons learned here about how tight to make that neck and that neck pocket connection. And definitely something I will pay closer attention to on future builds. That gap was fixed with a little bit of a wedge 
and some glue and some wood dust, and it actually turned out pretty good. Uh, it's definitely noticeable to me, obviously, but most people don't notice it unless I point it out. Now, this was one of the more harrowing things that I had to do. I am drilling the connection here between the back of the guitar, the electronics pocket, and the pocket here for the bridge pickup. And this was all line of sight. And when I saw that thing come through and not come through the top, it was a moment of pure celebration because at this point I had the neck glued on and all I could see was that drill bit plowing through the front of the guitar. So I'm so glad that didn't happen. Now, I mentioned before that this is something that is based on a James Hetfield guitar. And James Hetfield, the lead singer of Metallica, he's known for obviously a lot of different guitars, but the two that he's most closely associated with are both Gibson-style guitars. It's the Explorer and the Flying V. Now, he had a very distinct Explorer early on in his career, and I like the headstock on that one as well as on the original Explorer design. So you'll notice my headstock looks a little bit more like that. But he also has these amazing custom explorers that has been made for him by a guy, I think his name is Ken Lawrence. And he makes these amazing guitars, they're natural wood, they're mahogany, and they are just fantastic. So I modeled this after that. I'm using African mahogany for the body, African mahogany for the neck as well. And then like I mentioned, I've got a Honduran rosewood for the fretboard itself. And you know, this is a something, again, being such a big Metallica fan and such a big fan of James Hetfield, I just thought it would be so cool to build something that looked like some of the guitars that he played. And everything that I'm using on here is stuff that he uses. So the pickups that I'm going to put in are actually made by a company called EMG. They're his signature brand of pickups. He also has a signature set of strings, so I'm going to put that in there. And then as you'll see here in a little bit, with that dark mahogany and the rosewood, I thought it'd be nice to have black hardware. So the tuning machines and the bridge and everything are all going to be black. Now, if you made it this far in the video, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate the people that stick around and watch these things. I always try to make these a little bit educational, a little bit fun, a little bit entertaining. And if you feel like I earned your subscription, I would really appreciate it if you did subscribe. It obviously helps us out quite a bit. And for those who did make it this far, I want to know down in the comments below what your favorite Metallica song is. So let me know what that is. I'm always interested to hear what people have as their favorite song. Now, if you're a woodworker, you know that a ton of the work comes at the end of the project. That initial build, getting everything together, it's a lot of work, but nothing compares to those finishing details. And building a guitar is no different. You could see over the last few minutes here, a lot of these finishing details, tons of sanding, little bits of fretboard work with razor blades, routing out the cavity, making sure that I'm putting shielding paint into the cavities. What that black paint that you saw does is prevent electromagnetic waves and other sources of electricity from getting in and messing with your sound. It's kind of acts as a shielding agent. And I'm building a cavity cover here. Now I didn't have any extra mahogany, but I did have this nice piece of kind of figured cherry left over that I didn't really know what else to do with. And cherry darkens over time, and I thought that it would go great, especially with some oil on it. So resawed that, and you can see that I just used uh, a marker and some tape to kind of draw out the template, and it turned out fit pretty well. So part of the finishing details here now, this is where the controls are going to be. So the way I'm going to set this up, I don't like things to be too complicated. I'm going to have a master volume control. I'm going to have a master tone control. And then we're going to have a toggle switch. It's a three-way toggle switch that allows you to switch between the neck pickup, the bridge pickup, or both in between. And if you don't know what any of that means, that is totally okay. You don't have to. You'll see it all here in just a little bit. And the end grain was one of the toughest little details to work with. There were so many little flaws and imperfections. And I used, I think, every single sander that I have, except for the big Rotex, on this project. Now, for me, one of the hardest deals to figure out was the nut. I bought a pre-made nut. I didn't want to have to deal with kind of crafting my own. And so I started initially using a shoulder plane and some chisels to try to get the slot cut out for the nut here. That was proving to be a little tricky, so I ordered a specialty tool, and in the meantime, I started the finishing process. Now, I'm using a crimson guitar oil, and there are two types. I'm putting a base coat of the oil here on the entire guitar, 
And then the body and the headstock are getting what is called a high build oil. And the neck gets just a few more coats of the original base oil. The neck only got about three coats because you want the neck to be a little bit slicker. I wanted the headstock and I wanted the body to be nice and shiny. So it got, I think, six coats ultimately in the end to give it a nice sheen. So once that was all done, it was time to start putting the hardware in. So you can see here, I'm installing the tuning machines. If you're interested, I went with hip shot tuners. Um, they are locking tuners and never having used those before, they are amazing. So as I mentioned, this is my first ever guitar build and I am super stoked with how it came out, but I wanted to recognize a few folks who really helped me along the way. The first is Rob Schweitzer from Free Will Woodworking on Instagram. He is a huge inspiration for me in terms of this guitar building stuff and helped me out with some great resources, including Crimson Guitars, where I bought some tools, I bought the finishing oil and watched a ton of their videos uh, trying to figure out how to do this. And last but not least is, and I hope I say this right, it's Chicks Guitars. Uh, I will put the link for that down in the description. Has some great videos on how to build a guitar for beginners. So I am gonna give you a sound test here. Of course, with copyright issues, I can't play any Metallica songs. So I'm giving you some Metallica-esque riffage here so that you can actually hear how the guitar sounds. It sounds great, it looks amazing, and I am so happy and so thankful that you checked this video out. Thanks for watching and enjoy. Thank you. 